Section thirty four of Wheels, the Fifth Cycle. The Sleeper Vox recording is in the public domain. Eight more bucolic poems by Edith Sitwell. One Evening Prince Absalom and Sir Rotherham Red rock on a rocking horse, home to bed, with dreams like cherries ripening big beneath the frondage of each wig in a flat field on the road to sleep they ride together a hunting sheep that like the swan bright fountains seem their tails hang down as meek as a dream prince absalom seems a long fleeced bush the heat's tabernacle in the hush and the glamour of eve when buds the dew into bright tales that never come true and as he passes a cherry tree caught by his long hair bound is he while all his gold fleece flows like water into the lap of sir rotherham's daughter come then and sit upon the grass with cherries to pelt you as bright as glass vermilion bells that sound as clear as the bright swans who sighing you hear when they float to their crystal death of water scarcely plumed by the breath of air so clear in the round leaves they look this crystal sound scarce grieves as they pelt down like tears fallen bright from music or some deep delight the gardener cut off his beard of fast and tied up the fountain tree made it fast and bound it together till who can see which is prince absalom which is the tree only his gold fleece flows like water into the lap of sir rotherham's daughter sir rotherham red gathers bags of gold instead of the cherries ruddy and cold two the five musicians to osbert the blue leaved fig trees swell with laughter gold fissures split the ripe fruits after and like a gold barred tiger shade leaps in the darkness that they made the long ribbed leaves shed light that dapples silenus like a ton of apples gold freckled fruit shaped faces stare at nymphs with bodies white as air the ancient house rocked emptily horned brothers creep inside and see through my tall windows the abode of noise is on the dusty road they creep strange hands are on the hasp silenus sleepy as a wasp amid the fruit-ripe heat as in an apricot or nectarine replies the dust is wise and old for glistening fruits and ophers gold are gathered there to wake again in our flesh like a tune's refrain the five musicians with their bray shatter the fruit-ripe heat of day their faces wrinkled kind and old are masked by the hot sun with gold like fountains of blue water gush their beards strange feathered birds that hush their song move not so proud as these smiles floating ageless courtesies they stand upon the dust outside their tunes like drops of water died yet still we hear their slow refrain king pharaoh gay lad come again miss nettybun beneath the tree perceives that it is time for tea and takes the child a muslined moon through the lustrous leaves of afternoon and tea-time comes with strawberry jam yet where oh where is she on that music floating gone to china and to babylon never again she'll go to bed in the house of sir rotherham red three king cofetua and the beggar maid to alan porter the five-pointed crude pink tinsel star laughed loudly at king cofetua 
across the plain as black as mind and limitless it laughed unkind to see him whitened like a clown with the moon's flower come in a golden crown the moon shone softer than a peach upon the round leaves in its reach the dark air sparkled like a sea the beggar maid leaned out through a tree and sighed that pink flower spike full of honey oh for love ragged is time with no money then through the black night the gardener's boy as sun burnt as hay came whispering troy long ago was as sweet as the honey chimes in the flower bells jingling into rhymes and oh my heart sweet as a honey hive because of a wandering maid and i live but to tend the pale flower bells of the skies that shall drop down their dew on her sleeping eyes four clown argub's song clown argub the honey-bee counted his money see in the bandstand in hell buzzing the tunes that fell raise up glass houses round sir shoulders forcing ground lest bald heads harden in hell's kitchen garden poet and pedagogue bump their bald heads agog melon and marrow and cucumber narrow next day comes proserpine parasol raised and see ma'am says the gardener these thoughts are as thick as peas so sighed the clown singing buzz and still clinging to no horizontal bars but the pink freezing stars five fleecing time queen venus like a bunch of roses fat and pink that splashed dew closes underneath dark mulberry trees wandered with the fair-haired breeze among the dark leaves preening wings sit golden birds of light each sings will you accept the blue muslin as they peck the blackamoor mulberry skin then came a sheep like a sparkling cloud oh ma'am please ma'am sleek me proud come fleece and comb my golden wool and do not mind ma'am if you pull her flocks came thick as the mulberries that grow on the dark clear mulberry trees as thick as the daisies in the sky prince paris adonis as each passed by she cried come feed on buds as cold as my fleece lamb-tailed river's gold and you shall dance like each golden bird of light that sings in dark trees unheard and you shall skip like my lamb-tailed river in my buttercup fields for ever the lady venus with hair thick as wool cried come and be fleeced each sheepish fool six the higher sensualism queen circe the farmer's wife at the fair met three sailor men stumping there who came from the parrot plumed sea yo ho and each his own trumpet began to blow we come said they from the indian seas all bright as a parrot's feathers and these break on gold sands of the perfumed isles where the fruit is soft as a siren smiles and the sun is as black as a nubian we have singed the beard of the king of spain then we wandered once more on the south sea strand where the icebergs seem heavenly mansions fanned by the softest winds from the groves of spice and the angels like birds of paradise flit there we caught this queer plumaged boy an angel he calls himself for a toy the angel sighed please ma'am if you'll spare me a trumpet the angels will come to the fair for even an angel must have his fling and ride on the roundabout in the swing she gave him a trumpet but never a blare reached the angels from midsummer fair though he played will you hear a spanish lady and jack the sailor sweet nelly tree shady for only the gay hosannas of flowers sound loud as brass bands in those heavenly bowers 
queen circe the farmer's wife said i will buy your plumaged coat for my pig to try then with angels he'll go a dancing hence from sensuality into sense the fair's tombs like cherries and apricots ripened the angels danced from their green grots their hair was curled like the fruit on the trees rigadon saraband dance they these and the pig points his toe and he curves his wings the music starts and away he flings dancing with angels all in a round hornpipe and rigadon on the fair's ground seven falsetto song between the hairy leaves trills dew all tasting of fresh green anew and baskets of ripe fruit in air the bird songs seem suspended where like any feathered shrieking biped or creaking water brightly striped i stand and let my laughter flare beneath my waspish gilded hair my tame asses tee hee hee mimics the striped zebra sea as it munches all the land the real ground whereon we stand no eagle was it but a hen pecked prometheus fireheart when counting chicks before they hatched the farmer's gay wife left unlatched the door of the crazy hencoop laughter never closing ever after eight the fat woman the velvet black trees just behind have cast no shadow on my mind my whirring gilt hair clear as flutes seems cornucopias of fruits that negroid satyr the hot wind with his long fingers cannot find his way among my chins whose shapes seem bunches of hot glowing grapes the roses blaze like scarlet fire the ivy leaves are black as ire and bird songs are suspended there like colored hoops upon the air through which reverberate the lights in splintered glassy stalactites those lights that sting me waspishly as by the gentian colored sea i amble waves of colored flesh fantastically curled afresh i amble past i muse and see the placid world's rotundity made in my image fat and round and matronly the shy rebound of space from contact seems to me the most sincere of flattery of virtuous vacancy that thieves all colour from the world that lives yields like my mind where naught can make the least impression it will take end of section Section thirty five of Wheels, the fifth cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Press Cuttings The Saturday Review, The Vanguard of British Poetry. They are a portent. The Nation Harpies like nightingales, and nightingales like harpies, chirping balefully upon the walls of old Babylon. The Lancet we are sorry about the appendix. Anything to give pain. Paul Mall Gazette. Conceived in morbid eccentricity and executed in fierce, factitious gloom. Morning Post. We have no doubt whatever that, fifty years hence, the publication of Wheels will be remembered as a notable event in the inner history of English literature. Weekly Dispatch. Former literary regime. The publication of Wheels is regarded by all right-minded people as more a society event than a literary one. Editor's Note My dear sir, if you lived in Bayswater, as I do, you would realise how perfectly charming you have been. R.I.P. Topsy Jones, who died defending a common cause. Editor's Note Very 1919 
your memory is like a well-loved book wherein we go continually to look editor's note the memorial verse is from the ladies published translations and was once alas poor youth albert samin a tragedy of reaction it was a super poet of the neo-georgian kind whose fantasies transcended the simple bourgeois mind and by their frank transgression of all the ancient rules were not exactly suited for use in infant schools but holding that no rebel should shrink from fratricide his gifted brother georgians he suddenly defied and in a manifesto extremely clear and terse announced his firm intention of giving up free verse the range of his reaction may readily be guessed when i mention that for browning his devotion he confessed enthroned above the sitwells the artless muse of bab and said that marinetti was not as good as crab at first the manifesto was treated as a joke a boyish ebullition that soon would end in smoke but when he took to writing in strict and fluent rhyme his family decided to extirpate the crime two scientific doctors declared he was insane but likely under treatment his reason to regain so now he's in an asylum where he listens at his meals to a gramophone recital of the choicest bits from wheels End of section. Section thirty six of Wheels, the Fifth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bibliography Aldous Huxley, The Burning Wheel, published by B. H. Blackwell. Without any doubt, an original poet. The Nation. The Defeat of Youth, published by B. H. Blackwell. The best thing in Mr. Huxley's new volume is The Defeat of Youth. The later poems in the book belong to his subjective eccentric period wherein lies are notable epigrammatists, the nation. Mr. Huxley is a poet whom it is as difficult to praise outright as it is to overlook him altogether. If Mr. Huxley could abandon his search for the rarer emotions for rareness sake, and if he could be a little less ingenious all round, he would be a better poet. Land and Water Mr. Huxley's great merit is that he does not attempt to conceal his sophistication. His great defect is that the degree of his sophistication is rather overwhelming. His verse is truly elegant. His rhythms are good. It is incisely phrased, it is devoid of clichés, it is often ironically witty, and often originally and agreeably coloured. It would be possible to demonstrate his power to write beautifully and well from almost any page in his volume. The New Statesman Mr. Huxley is a poet who focuses his mind without stint into verse, a process which has its dangers. But his mind is so richly stored and so quickly receptive that the result never lacks interest. It is clear that any idea or emotion that comes to him has the best possible chance of surviving beautifully. The Times Leader, just published, Chatto and Windus Limbo, just published, Chatto and Windus Sherard Vines, The Two Worlds Published by B. H. Blackwell An extremely vivid and charming poet. The Nation The Kaleidoscope Just published William Keen Seymour Sword and Flute Osbert Sitwell Argonaut and Juggernaut Chateau and Windus Old ways and new ways of writing poetry are effectively exemplified in Mr. Sitwell's interesting and accomplished if not seldom tantalising, volume. The Scotsman It is the fashion to slang our young poets, but the answer to their critics, which they make in such volumes as Argonaut and Juggernaut, and Mr. Sassoon's war poems, seems to me a pretty satisfying one. They were the first Englishmen of letters to exhibit the war in the dress in which generations of their countrymen will assuredly see it. They, and they alone, subduing their artists' sense to this debt of service to humanity, 
but giving it also its due vesture of grace and freedom in expressing to unthinking, unhearing England what it meant. The Nation Wayfarer Irony has been an art lost this long while to English letters. Mr. Sitwell has found it, has established it, has triumphed in a medium of all the most difficult to the English sense. He is elegant, suave, restrained, and mighty. Iron, cold iron, is master of men all. He has avoided the easy mistake of making it hot and soft. Daily Herald Mr. Osbert Sitwell has a rich and fantastic imagination. The section called The Phoenix Feasters is brimful of beauty and brightness. Miss Rose Macaulay in the Daily News In all the volume there is not a poem but counts because of its intellectual and emotional content. Birmingham Post Captain Sitwell, in his combative moods, is one of the swiftest pursuers of Mrs. Grundy. Times Literary Supplement There is a big hatred in this young man for facts which many respectable folks accept either with a half-hidden eagerness or with a shrug of the shoulders. He is a wit and a scourge and a genuine poet. He can make your blood curdle unless you have made too much money out of the war with his terrible picture of the modern Abraham, a piece of grim satire suitably dedicated to his friend and fellow poet Siegfried Sassoon. Bystander Sir Cheverell Sitwell, The People's Palace, published by B. H. Blackwell This is the most advanced poetry we have had so far, advanced in that it is founded on a theory probably new to this country. Robert Nichols in The New Witness We have attributed more to Mr. Sitwell than to any poet of quite his generation, we require of him only ten years of toil. T. S. Eliot in The Egoist The Mayor of Mercia is almost unreadable for dullness. Jones, Miss Topsy, in A. or The Common Cause. The word dire shows real observation and imagination. It illuminates. It is the word one might have thought of and didn't. Jones, Miss Topsy in A, or The Common Cause. Editor's Note. Hoity-toity, Topsy Jones. Our Stylists. The People's Palace purports to be a collection of verse by Sir Cheverell Sitwell. Its sheer inanity is beyond description. The audacity of wasting precious paper, to say nothing of printing ink, on such unadulterated drivel, take, sick, one's breath away. The World. Edith Sitwell, Clowns' Houses, published by B. H. Blackwell. Miss Sitwell's verses may remind some people of the Italian comedy seen through a distorting mirror. The Italian comedy is a little formula that will contain a very large bulk of life, and Miss Sitwell's performing matter has mind behind it. We convolute and spiralise, but somebody has hold of the strings. Her method has, to a certain extent, been a cockshy for the trumpery reviewer, but inasmuch as she does not use it either perversely or to exploit her personality, we rather admire her courage than deprecate the chosen vessel of its wrath. The Nation If, by chance, which is not so improbable as appears, Miss Sitwell's teapot reminded her first of the Tower of London and then of Joan of Arc, she would say so without hesitation or consistency. For the most part, we believe that she is trying her best to be honest with her own conceptions, and, that being so, she is of course perfectly right not to care whether they appear outlandish. Times Literary Supplement She is a poet for whose poetry the taste must emphatically be acquired. What seemed like imaginative madness shows on acquaintance much method. The Oxford Chronicle Miss Sitwell can write fête galante and perverted nursery rhymes as well as any poet alive. New Statesman Miss Sitwell is best and most herself when she dances a graceful grotesque pas seul of absurdities, using rhyme, as Monsieur Duhamel puts it, 
pour t'appuyer de talon les pas d'une petite danse qui sont commodes, and pour mettre des talons rouges dans une fête galante. The Saturday Westminster Gazette. Her vision and her technique are so individual as to be inimitable. Her manner of expression is admirably suited to herself. It is perhaps suited to nobody else. She observes the surfaces of things not only with abnormal clearness, but with delight. And the youth, or rather the childlikeness of her vision, makes us see them more clearly also, or recalls our own bygone vision of them again. Her satire is the satire of a very young person, or a fairy. The New Age Edith Sitwell, The Wooden Pegasus, published by B. H. Blackwell. Miss Sitwell's perversity, ceasing to be ethical, has passed into its aesthetic perfection. She is indeed quite a virtuoso. Times Literary Supplement. Reality takes on the strange nightmarish qualities of hallucination. Miss Sitwell's method is limited in scope, but within its limitations can produce interesting and often fantastically beautiful results. We see her work at its best, and most characteristic, the hallucinated vision, the precise, glassily bright technique, the curiously profound wit, in the fifteen bucolic poems. Letter from the Native to the Editor of Wheels, re the Swiss Rhapsody. Zwölf Herzogstrasse, Bern. Dear Miss Edith, just I received a lovely poem from Mr. Sacheveril about Switzerland when he was travelling from Italy through saint plon les Genève. Really, I am enjoying very much to read this poem where I am native from this country. Since, like Schiller, the great poet from Germany, when he was travelling in the wonderful lake from Lausanne and write this work from William Tell, I should be very pleased when to have some more poem from Mr. Suchville Sitwell about Switzerland. I am remain your sincerely, Frieda Widmer. Note, the editor of Wheels will shortly answer all the attacks in a pamphlet to be published separately. The attackers are properly in for it. End of section. End of Wheels, the Fifth Cycle. Recording by Nemo, Eva Davis, Newgate Novelist, and Algie Pug.